Hello and welcome. I'm Roger Ream, and this is the Liberty and Leadership Podcast, a conversation with TFAS alumni, supporters, faculty, and friends who are making a real impact in public policy, business, philanthropy, law, and journalism. Today, I'm joined by Debbie Henney, the Director of Curriculum for FTE, an organization that became part of the Fund for American Studies in 2013. Debbie is an economics professor and director of the honors program at Mesa Community College in Mesa, Arizona. Debbie started her teaching career after spending 10 years teaching economics in high school. This is her 15th year teaching college students. When she isn't teaching, she feeds her passion for economic literacy by writing K through 12 lessons and curriculum units for economics classrooms and presenting programs, workshops, and in-service trainings for schools, teachers, and students around the world. Debbie, it's a pleasure to have you with me today. Well, we're here in Amelia Island, Florida for a TFAS donor conference, and you ran a great session this morning for our supporters on economics and the environment. And I hope we can talk a little bit about that curriculum and how you've transformed it now from just being just a teacher pro, uh, curriculum to when we're gonna try this summer with high school students. Sure. Uh, but first, let me ask you about what attracted you to uh, the profession of economics and economic education in the first place. Actually, I thought I wanted to be a math teacher when I, when I entered college. And I found myself sitting in an economics classroom with an amazing economics teacher. His name was Greg Pratt. And, and, and then a second economics class, Harold Kranswick taught that one. And I, it just opened my eyes to a whole new way of thinking about the world that I had never experienced before. And so I quickly you know, realized that, that teaching economics was for me. <laughs> and math, you know, I still have a place in my heart for math, but, but it quickly became about economics. What, I, what was really sad to learn was that there were very few spots for teaching economics. So I had to wait my time. I had to become qualified to teach social studies, which is a much oh, more yeah. broad subject. And then once I got into the high school classroom and became a social studies teacher, I learned most people don't want to teach economics. So I didn't have to wait long before I had my, my own spot in an economics classroom. Well, that, that's great to give a shout out to two economics professors by name. Uh, that doesn't happen as often as it probably should. Uh, and, and maybe I'll get into a little bit about the way economics is taught in colleges and universities. Uh, but uh, g speaking to the point you just made, I imagine it's not very often that teachers trained uh, in most teaching schools or planning to go become teachers take any economics in college. Is that right? Yeah. So even it's if they're going into social studies? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I know this because of my work with the Foundation for Teaching Economics and other organizations like that. Um, that most teachers who are, uh, uh, they're assigned to teach economics because they're the social studies teacher or they're the newest teacher in. And so they, they come to programs, FTE programs, because they have nothing. You know, they don't know what to do. I'm, oh my gosh, I've been assigned to teach economics. What am I gonna, please help me, I need something. And, um, and, and because of that, we, you know, we have a, a hungry audience and great resources and, and we prepare them and they're, you know, once they leave our programs, they're excited to teach economics. So that's the good news. There's resources out there. It's getting the word out and letting them know that, um, you know, they don't have to do it alone, <laughs> that yeah. it's, not, it's not a death sentence, you know, being, or a life sentence being sentenced to teach <laughs> economics, you know, it's because they come in very scared. They don't know anything about an economics. Often their only experience, maybe they had an economics class in college, and yeah. usually, you know, that it wasn't a good experience. <laughs> so, so they don't come usually excited to teach it, but we change that. Well, despite the fact that you had some background in economics, you still chose when you were a teacher to do an FTE program. Uh, what led you to do that? And uh, tell me what that experience was like. So like I mentioned I loved math. Yes. And I thought all my students would love math like I did. So there's a part of economics that's very, that involves math and it's mm -hmm. um, very mechanical and there's beautiful graphs and tables. And I was shocked that my high school students didn't love the graphs and the math and the charts and the, you know, as much as I did. And so I, I wanted ways to make economics more fun. And there was, I actually had a teacher and, um, that had, in my department who had been to an FTE program who said, 
you should go to this program. It was a, a program, I think it was actually called the Environment, and the, it was one of the Environment yeah. and the Economy programs. And they were gonna be in Tucson, Arizona. So I went to that program. I was looking for ways to spice up my classroom. And once again, it changed my life. You know, I realized that um, it introduced me to, to an interactive way of teaching, experiential learning, where I could use activities and make my classroom engaging. And, and so it didn't have to be about the math and the graphs, and I didn't have to make the students love that. And they learned economics. So there's a part of me, you know, I taught AP economics for years, mm -hmm. <laughs> and my students could get fives on that AP exam. But I look back and I wonder, but did they leave, you know, my earliest students, did they really appreciate those fundamental principles of economics? Um, like the students who had me later after I'd had a lot of FTE programs. So I kept going, you know, to other programs and soaking up all that FTE had. And then one day I got a call, <laughs> you know, asking, would you be interested in teaching FTE programs? I think they had um, asked for some recommendations and somebody passed my name along and I was excited to, you know, throw my hat in the ring and, and try my hand at teaching FTE programs. And the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah. Well, uh, the activities-based methods that FTE prides itself in using and teaching and training teachers to use, what is the advantage of those? Do you think it is a, leaves it as a stickier thing that it stays with students longer if they've learned by doing? Uh, yeah, what do you as think much about as that? we as teachers love <laughs> lectures, students don't remember those lectures the same way as they do experiences. And so if you can create those experiences in the classroom, they remember those learning experiences. You know, I have this one story I, in particular that I remember of running okay. into a student I had <laughs> years later. He had grown up, gotten married, had four children <laughs> by this point, and he ran into me and he said, uh, you know, and, and I had a, a, one of my, you know, my kids was with me at the time back when he was really little. <laughs> and, and he said, your mom is a great teacher. <laughs> so I, rem I remember thanking him for that because, you know, it's not often that somebody will tell your you kids. Want, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, but then he proceeded to say, do you still do that activity with a stick of gum? And I didn't really recall the activity at first. I was like, uh, he goes, you know, you passed out sticks of gum in the classroom and then, and we had different towns and in the town where there were, and we, we were selling the sticks of gum back to you. And when there was in the town with lots of sellers of sticks of gum, the price was really low. But in the town where there's only one such, you know, seller of stick of gum, the price was really high. And it was just this, I rem, you know, he's, he there was a huge light you. bulb. Yeah, a light bulb went on above my head. I thought, this is the power of those activities. Because years had gone by, and not only did he remember the activity, but he remembered the lesson that went with the activity. Yeah. He didn't remember a single thing I lectured on, right? But he remembered that lesson of how powerful competition is, and that consumers benefit from competition because it means lower prices. And so that, that stuck with me. I remembered that. Now, that activity... It was marge, you know. It was it was okay, but it wasn't good enough to, to keep in this you know slot of activities I do. I had passed it up for other better activities. Did you bring it back? But it worked. <laughs> it worked enough that you know it stuck with him, yeah. and that you know reminded me of why I do why I do those activities because they stick. They they remember, and the learning happens because they discover, the lesson, uh, you know, at, through their own experience. It's not just me telling them. Here, here's this thing you should know. It's them discovering and having that aha moment on their own. So, so as teachers, we can create this common ex learning experience, and then the discussion and the lessons and the things you know come from that. Well, in the uh, programs we do for students, uh, the Economics for Leaders programs, they're roughly six days long in the summer. We do about 20 on college campuses. Could you just kind of walk through those days and how they're used uh, in, a, in a high level way, the yeah. kinds of activities and concepts you're getting across. Yeah, during so the in week. the mornings they get, <laughs> it's, it's econ and they get that active learning, you know, with a mentor teacher like me. Um, and then they have a professor who's the content expert that they get to learn from. But even our professors, we handpick professors that are engaging teachers. You know, not when, when people hear I teach economics, I, the common response I get is, Oh, 
or, oh, I hated that class or something <laughs> like that. So we, those aren't the professors. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the yeah. ones that you might remember from college. We don't pick those professors. We pick professors that are, are engaging teachers and even their lectures, they're activity based, you know, so mm -hmm. they're engaging the students all along the way in little mini activities. And then they have those activities, those larger activities like I was talking about. Um, and that's what their mornings look like. Then they go to lunch, and then they participate in these leader, leadership activities. So I like to say in the mornings they're learning about kind of the, the world around them and how it works and why people do what they do and how people respond to incentives and learning about the rules of the game and how they shape you know, why people do what they do. And then in the afternoons when they go and learn about leadership, they're learning about themselves as a leader and how they work within that world and how they can use their talents and their strengths and their abilities to be an actor in that world and 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 actually you know over the years it's been interesting to see how we used to get students that would come and be so excited about the leadership and it was like oh and i have to do this economics and they'd be really nervous about the economics and lately we get a lot of students that come and they're super excited about economics and really nervous about leadership uh. like engaging with other people they're really nervous about that. And so, I, you know, either way, these are both really important life skills that we think complement each other. So if we can have students come out of the program, you know, understanding the economic way of thinking, being good critical thinkers who are also good leaders, um, that we're prepping them to be, you know, better actors in the world in the future. And so that, you know, and, the, and that leadership takes up their afternoons, you know, evenings, there's a little bit of econ sometimes in the evenings. They have a fun little event that they usually get to participate in. They make friendships that last, you know, a lifetime. You know, my kids went to the programs. My daughter, you know, she's still, I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm talking to, you know, so-and-so in China from my EFL program. I'm like, really? You're still in touch? So they have and a great that's time. That's after a week-long program. A week-long yeah. program. Yeah. Even the virtual programs we do. The kids, yeah. by the end of the week, are like, I wish this was longer, you know, and they have friends that they made. And I'm like, you just spent a week online in a, on a, in a virtual program on the computer and you've made friends, you know, yeah. and you've, you know, so <laughs> it's amazing. The programs are great. I, I still love teaching in them and I've sent my own kids great. and I'll send my youngest this year. I'm very excited. Well, you used a phrase that we use a lot, uh, the economic way of thinking that we're teaching. Uh, could you explain what that means? Yes. And we yeah. have what we call the economic way of thinking is um, best described, I think, by our economic reasoning propositions. And the first one is that people choose, recognizing that individuals are the actors and we're the decision makers and, and that choices result in social outcomes. And so if we want to better understand you know, outcomes in the world, we have to understand the individuals that are at the heart of those choices. And then those choices, um, every choice that somebody makes, a cost comes with that. And so as, you know, I like, I think about my grandma, she used to say, choosing is refusing. <laughs> when you mm -hmm. choose something, you're giving something else up. And it's not like we go through the world choosing good from evil, you know, because that would be easy, right? <laughs> good right, from evil. Right. Well, it's, it's, a, it's we're choosing good things most of the time. We're choosing good things from other really good things, you know, like we're in this beautiful island. And it's like, do we spend this free time that we have here, here in Amelia <laughs> Island right here doing this interview when the beach is right there, right? That's right. two really good options, right? And so uh, we may have chosen the wrong one, but <laughs> opportunity, <laughs> opportunity cost, cost, right, is what yeah. we call that. So that's principle two, um, just remembering to think in terms of alternatives and trade-offs and cost of our choices. Yeah. Um, and then the third one is that people respond to incentives in predictable ways. And so if you want to understand the choices that people make, you have to understand the incentives that they face. So whether it's our Economics for Leaders program or our Environment and the Economy program or our our economic forces in American history program, if we want to understand why people did what they did, even if it's looking back in history, we have to step into the shoes of those individuals and try to figure out the incentives as they saw them. Um, and related to that, number four is that institutions matter. And when we talk about institutions and economics, we're talking about the rules of the game, the formal rules like laws and the informal rules like customs and traditions and social norms, because those shape the choice, the incentives, and influence mm -hmm. the 
you know, the choices that yeah, people make. Yeah. Those can be really, they can constrain, you know, alternatives that we, can cons we would even consider. And so, and then the last one is really important. It's no about knowledge and evidence. You know, knowledge and evidence impart value to opinions. So opinions, everybody has an opinion. But if you want to change minds or have a, you know, can engage in a debate with somebody or have a conversation or it helps if you can back your opinions up with knowledge you know with, have with some evidence, evidence. Yeah. have some evidence yeah. yeah to know take something from an opinion to knowledge and so we always tell the students don't don't take what i don't just believe what i say look for evidence you know to back it up go go look it up you know go and always be asking where's the evidence to back this up um, we want our students to always be lifelong learners, looking, you know, don't ever, just always be questioning, always be looking for new evidence. I consider myself a life, lifelong learner. I can give lots of examples of things I've changed my mind on when confronted with new evidence. And I think that's something important because not enough, not not enough, enough people of us do that. Do that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So from these economic reasoning principles, you outline the five, uh, you can then teach students about, say, the role of prices in directing resources to highly valued activities. You can talk about comparative advantage and trade and exchange, yes. and you move on from that to these other concepts? Yes, it just it teaches them to be critical thinkers and to be able to look at policies, for example. Yeah. And, and, you know, for example, something like minimum wage, you know, it's it, instead of taking something like minimum wage and having a debate about, is the, you know, is it right? Is it wrong? It becomes something we can all get, you know, what, what is minimum wage about? It, we want better outcomes for, for the people at the bottom. And so we can look at that policy and we could say, does it give us the outcomes we want? And if it doesn't, is there, is there a better way to get those outcomes? Mm -hmm. Everybody can get behind better outcomes. Right. And that's what these, this, you know, critical thinking does. It allows them to examine things like policies and say, can we get a better outcome? You know, and that's not divisive. Like all the, the students in the programs, they all want better outcomes. You know, we all care about poor people. We all care about the environment. We want better outcomes. So how can we use our scarce resources to get better outcomes? Yeah. Well, I've, I've watched, you know, many of these activities and the students just get really engaged in it. You've, you do the trading game, which has been used in FT programs for many years, and the students are out of their chairs. Uh, trading first with maybe someone right across from them and then with a group and then the whole classroom and it looks like chaos right. <laughs> as they run around trying to improve their situation and you show them at the end of that activity how everyone's almost everyone at least their 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 satisfaction has increased through extended markets and trading and I've seen it with the you do the uh, property rights exercises where they're fishing in a pond and uh, uh, talk a little bit about those activities that are used. Yeah, like the second one you mentioned, yeah. that tragedy of the commons activity. Right. Just it doesn't matter. I've done that with, with wealthy, you know, board members. You know, with yeah, their cufflinks. Yeah, retreats. <laughs> <laughs> and and they respond the same way. You know, high school students or high school teachers do. And you you say go, and the, the fish are valuable, and everybody grabs them before their before the first round even ends. And in the second time, you change the rules of the game and you institute some form of property rights and it changes their behavior. They didn't inherently change. They didn't care about the environment differently. It's the rules of the game changed and they changed their behavior. And so we use examples like that, you know, those experiential kind of things for, so they can see in action, they can discover it's the same people. Yeah. They're just responding to different incentives, different rules of the game, and, and it creates different outcomes. And, and, you know, in that case, changing the rules of the game, it, it, it created an incentive for people to conserve when we do the next round where, they're, where there are property rights. All of a sudden, they're like, whoa, whoa I don't, I don't want to harvest my fish early and sell them. You know, I want to wait till they're more valuable. I, well, you're, you're passionate about economics, as am I. Uh, I uh, know that with my three daughters, uh, when they went off to college, I told them all they had to take a course in economics which they did. Uh, one, my oldest daughter double majored in history and economics. My other two took some economics. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the way economics is taught in college. And, and maybe it applies to high school as well, because I fear that, uh, well, I think it was Dwight Lee or maybe it was Paul Hain who said, you know, you should teach economics, not as if it's the first course a student will take on their way to get their PhD, but if it, it's the last course they'll ever take. So give them that great overview of what economics, that it's about choices people make. It's about the way the world works. 
uh, but that's not always the case at least. And, you know, I think students who take that first psych course or a psych sociology course say, oh, this is really neat. I'm going to major in psychology or sociology. And of course, a lot of economics is about psychology. And but you have some thoughts, I know, on the way economics is taught in college. Yeah. Could you share I'm, those? I'm definitely a believer of that Paul Hain perspective. Yeah. And I, I look at my students and I think this is maybe the only economics class they ever have. And I and and it's not so important that they be able to use the lingo or you know memorize the you know shift cost curves or yeah. I want them to walk away with just that basic economic way of thinking. And so that wherever they go, they can they can be that critical thinker. And unfortunately, as you mentioned, though, that is not the way it's taught in most college classrooms. And I think that in part, this is my person, my my theory, is that most people that teach economics, they don't have a background in teaching. They mm -hmm. have a background mm -hmm. in taking economics classes from other teach people who taught economics, other ah, professors. Yeah. And so they just do what they've seen, right? And so they lecture, they talk about economics. I think there's also this philosophy of, of, I don't, of needing to weed people out, you know? We need to make those beginning classes really hard so that you know, we can we thin out the people who want right. to major in economics. One, one of the things I love is when you look at the most um, you know, profitable majors, economics is always top of the list. When you look at return, you know, bang for your buck, the uh, return on investment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and so I think that some economists don't like that. They don't want the competition. So <laughs> economists love talking about competition and how wonderful it is until but not they, for themselves. But not for themselves, right? And so I think you know. So there's part of that. You know, we need to make it hard. And then there's just that. Uh, so I'm going to lecture and I'm going to make it really hard, like it was when I took economics. You need to you need to endure this, like a boot camp or something. Um, and and it just persists, right? And so I often I get students that take my class and, and they, ex, they have low expectations. They don't even know what the class is. It's often a requirement for another major or something. And they're pleasantly surprised. You know, that's, the, that's usually the case. Because I'm at a community college, I rarely get students that are majoring economics. Occasionally, I'll get a couple that might change their major, yeah. right? But I, it's not my, my goal to turn them into economists. My goal is just to, I want economic thinkers matters. out there in the world, no matter what field they're in. And I wish, I wish we could have more um, professors in, in economics who just understood teaching and the pedagogy of teaching. You know, it's not just about lecturing. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, you're the curriculum director for our FT programs. Talk, uh, what does that involve? We Are have, you? so we have curriculum <laughs> that yeah. we, and keeping that updated. <clears throat> and we've always got, um, you know, new new ideas for new new curriculum. One of our more recent programs that we've written a curriculum for is on the federal budget debt yeah, and deficit, right. and so that's one that always needs updating because uh, you know I was as I was updating it this year um, with the most recent released federal budget data. We it's mandatory our, our tax revenue. I learned is even exceeds our mandatory spending or or our mandatory spending is even larger than our tax revenue that we bring in. So we have this pennies activity that teachers I've do. So we participated to, in it. Yeah, yeah, we have to rewrite that whole thing because there's not even enough pennies to cover, <laughs> you know, mandatory spending. So things like uh, that, that, you know, it involves that. But then those curriculum, writing those curriculum units, but then teaching and, and teaching other people that can train teachers on those curriculum units um, is, is a big part of the job as well. We have a whole team of people like me who go out yeah. and teach in the programs. And then for our professors, we, they have academic freedom, you know, in, in our programs, but we like to, you know, we have a, we want the similar kind of experience when students go to programs. And so we, we give them kind of a curriculum framework. And I, like I mentioned, we help them. We want their activities to be, have mini, act, their lectures to have mini activities and be engaging. And so we give them, you know, ideas and tips and many activities they can use and they can incorporate into their lectures on the different topics. And so we prepare and keep all those current every year for all of those lessons. Well, so. in, in 2020, uh, we hit the COVID <clears throat> pandemic and the lockdowns and suddenly we had to shift a lot of these, prog all of these programs to a virtual format. Uh, How do you manage that? I forgot all about that, but you're right. <laughs> I spent, we knew nothing about that, and I attended a Zoom meeting. I had never even heard about Zoom and realized 
you know, and then Ted was like, we're going forward with, with you know, programming this year. And you I have mean, two months to yeah. <laughs> and then get it Programs are starting this year, this summer. There was no, we didn't take any time off. And, and so we, I had to very quickly learn how to use Zoom. We had to teach our professors and our mentor teachers how to use Zoom. And then we had to take every one of our lectures and activities and make it something that could be done in a virtual environment. So I had to seek out a, tools, you know, Pear Deck and all these interactive, you know, th resources that we could make them, make our lessons interactive. And the great thing was we were like, because we acted so quickly, because they, because Ted <laughs> didn't let us take any <laughs> downtime, we were ready to go for teachers. It was so, remarkable. And so teachers were, were that fall ready to go, had to teach. And a lot of, they were all teaching virtually as well, and they needed help. And so we were like, guess what we learned this summer? We learned how to do this two months before you. We were ready to teach them. And so we had workshop after workshop after workshop filled with teachers. And, and all those lessons we had trained, you know, converted to virtual lessons, we were just handing them out to teachers that would come to the workshops and the slides to go with them. And so now a lot of our materials are available both for if teaching in a traditional classroom environment as well as a virtual environment. And a great um, takeaway from that is that now we, the demand for virtual programs is still there. And I don't think it will ever go away because people have been exposed to it. They're comfortable with it. It allows us to reach teachers in areas that we haven't gone to in the past. You know, we have, so we, we have a continual offering of virtual programs alongside of our historical in-person in programming. So it's uh, actually been a great thing. Yeah, well, it was remarkable what you were able to accomplish in, you know, from like April 1 to June when you were hitting the ground. Yeah, uh, you, <laughs> it was, it was busy, A lot of busy. long nights. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was great help to teachers all across the country who had to teach in that really difficult circumstances. Just recently, uh, the previous chairman of FT, uh, Jerry Hume, passed away. His father, Jack, had founded the organization. Uh, it has a remarkable history, I know, uh, with uh, his leadership and also Gary Walton, longtime president, they brought in the likes of Milton Friedman and his wife Rose, two great economists, the John Taylor from Stanford, and I shouldn't be naming names because there are many others who played a role in this, but did you have the opportunity at all to interact with some of those board members? Like, I did. Yeah. I remember being yeah. in Jerry Hume's home yeah. um, one, one time for dinner, and that was an amazing experience, and being at board meeting you know, with, with him, it was, uh, it just, being with somebody who cared so much about something like economic education, mm -hmm. that's actually not easy to find. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I, it was, it was great when we found the partnership with TFAS, some you know, to carry that, continue carrying that flag because the Foundation for Teaching Economics has a place in my heart. It did a lot to change, you know, my my path and my success as a teacher. It's responsible for making me more effective, and and that's why I'm happy to continue working with the organization and kind of passing that on. You know, they back when I think not enough people even knew what economic education was, I think saw yeah. something in the importance of that. And I think we have we have those founders to thank for the legacy that FTE is. There are a lot of teachers out there who, you know, FTE has a, a name, a recognition with those teachers and even just the way that we do our programming, Milton Friedman, you know, he, I mean, there were, he was the one who said, if you really want to have an impact, you have to go after teachers. You can't, you can't just do student programs because you will only ever reach so many students. But yeah. a teacher teaches hundreds of students every year. And if you can go out there and teach teachers, your impact will be far, far greater. And so, so that's important. And that's why we why we teach teachers. They need it. They need, they need help. They need resources and they deserve it. You know, yeah, they're definitely uh, undervalued. I recall shortly after our, the partnership and FTE became part of TFAS, <laughs> speaking with Ted Tucker, who oversees these programs, Ted asked, posed a question, something like, you know, do you think we should put more emphasis on the student programs or on the teacher programs? Because we were mindful of uh, that the human endowment was going to be spent out and we'd have to find new sources of money. And I think my response to him was both. You know, we got to do both. Uh, yeah. I love the direct-to-student programs. There's yes. a great demand for them. But as you said, with a teacher, you know, that teacher is going to see a lot of students in the classroom in their lifetime. So it's a, it's a leveraged yeah. investment in training a teacher. So right. I'm, I'm so glad we're able to do both and continue to do it. And uh, you've just done a fabulous job, Debbie, running these uh, the curriculum, developing the curriculum. So thank you for all your hard work for FTE and 
may it continue. Thank you. Uh, I think we're running short on time, but uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Uh, thanks so much. You did a uh, program this afternoon for some of our TFAS college student alums. I hope that went well. It on, went great. That they was were... on economics in the environment. Yes. We had them, they're younger, so we had them down on the floor cleaning up a polluted lake. They were great participants. It was, but. Well, just before we conclude, on that economics environment program that uh, we're extending this summer to the high school level, what are some of the issues you see that come up on the environment when it relates to, how does economics play a role in that? We've been doing that program with teachers for a long time, but it's, a, it's something that students are often even more passionate about than teachers, to be honest. And, and the issues that come up, you know, things like cl climate change and, you know, pollution in general, um, species and preservation of species, yeah. all of those, the discussion can be elevated when you add in that economic way of thinking and that critical thinking analysis. And that's what we hope to bring to those kind of issues. It's not about, you know, is it a good thing or a bad thing or should we be having these conversations? It's, it's about can we take it to the, can we elevate the level of discussion? Can we find better outcomes? And, and students are willing participants. They're excited about, you know, they care about the environment. They, they want better outcomes. And they're going to be the ones having those conversations and sitting around the tables and being the decision makers and being the leaders in the future. So it's important that we, we, we that, introduce them to that economic that, way of thinking now. Yeah, and they understand the choices and the costs yeah. involved, and and so Absolutely. often it's talked about. So, so yes. often that's ignored. And yes, just, we yeah. we rarely are are alternatives, and that's what came up in, in our discussion with the college students. Is is economics r reminds us it trains us to think in terms of alternatives. It's not just you know should we do this. It's what are the opportunity costs? What are the alternatives? It's you know we're living in a world of scarcity. We, live in a we world can't of scarcity. address every problem. So how do we determine yes. which ones to tackle? Right. Yeah. And if we're going to clean up, if we're going to do another round of cleanup in this lake, you know, where 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 does the money come from, and is what you get for it worth, you know, what yeah. you're giving up for it? And they, Incentives as we went and, to each round yeah. of cleanup, they were balancing the marginal benefit and the marginal cost, and you know, not conversations. You're right that are not often <laughs> had in government. We like to think about the benefits. We don't like to talk about the costs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. My guest today has been Debbie Henney, Curriculum Director of the Foundation for Teaching Economics. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. thank you for listening to the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, like, or share the show on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like this episode, I ask you to rate and review it. And if you have a comment or question for the show, please drop us an email at podcast at tfas.org. The Liberty and Leadership Podcast is produced at K-Global Studios in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Roger Ream, and until next time, show courage in things large and small.